Hey everyone, Andrew from Educate here, and in this video, I'm going to do an overview of how to access Zero APIs with Python using OAuth 2. You will obviously need a Zero account for this. If you're watching this video as someone who isn't familiar with Python and APIs, what this means for you is if you're what I like to call a hybrid IT accountant, you can now access your accounting data programmatically instead of clicking through Xero, exporting a CSV, and opening in Excel. You can now speed up your data analysis by doing it all in Python. Now this is what the data is going to come out as. A JSON, which you can easily convert to a Python dictionary, extract the fields you want, and put it into a pandas data frame, and do your analysis from there, and even chart it out with matplotlib. The documentation we're going to use can be found at developer.zero.com forward slash documentation forward slash OAuth2 forward slash auth hyphen flow. Or you can find it manually by going to developer.zero.com docs, getting started, OAuth2 on the top left, and finally the OAuth flow. This is the page that explains to us how to connect to the Zero APIs. The first thing it wants us to do is to create an OAuth2 app. So let's do that by clicking on the link and logging in. Then click on Try OAuth2 and fill in the details of your app. I'll call mine Educate App. Company URL doesn't matter too much, but I'll put my website httpseducate.com privacy policy we can leave alone and the redirect URL you can use localhost or https 0.com and agree to the T's and C's and click create app. Then make note of your client ID and client secret by clicking generate a secret. You'll need this later to exchange this for an access token. If we come back to the OAuth2 page this high-level diagram explains the steps needed to call the Zero APIs. The orange box is the Educate app I just created, and first off, we're going to ask for access to our account and tenancy by exchanging the details of our app for an authorization code. We'll then take that authorization code and exchange it for an access token, which allows our Educate app access to the Zero APIs. We then use the access token to pick which tenant we want access to. A tenant is just which company we want to open in our Xero account. That might be the demo company or your own company, for example. Then combining both the access token and tenancy, we can query our accounting data. And if I keep scrolling down the page, there's seven steps we need to code in order to connect to Xero. We have send a user to authorize your app, Users are redirected back to you with a code. Exchange the code. Receive your tokens. Check the full set of tenants. Refresh access tokens and then call the API. I've written all this up in a Jupyter Notebook which I'll link in the video description below. I want to keep this diagram here as a reference so let me just rearrange my windows. So let's go to step one, send a user to authorize your app. We're going to take this URL and substitute these five values into it. Response type, client ID, scope, redirect URI, and state. And if we look at our Jupyter Notebook, you can see I've put the five values into the URL. Response type equals code. I've substituted client ID and redirect URL from our connected app, scope, for this example, I've selected accounting transactions, which gives me access to all these parts of Xero, and offline access, which gives me the refresh token that I'll need later. You can see the full list in this link here. And this is just asking which part of our account we want to access, payroll, invoices, or other accounting transactions. I've selected offline access, which gives me the refresh token that I'll need later and I've chosen accounting transactions. And these are the list of transactions that I can access. And finally state, this is just to say, if someone has access to my Educate app and knew my client ID in secret, 
and try to make the API request with it, and they use a different unique string to what I normally call, then it could be someone else posing as me. Don't worry about it too much for this example, I'll just use the default 123. Now I'll just quickly substitute my client ID and client secret into the Jupyter Notebook. And if we open a new web browser with the web browser module and click through the screens, we can allow access to our connected app and allow access to our demo company tenancy. And what's returned back to us is the redirect URL, which we specified as https0.com and the authorization code here. So coming back to our diagram, we've just done step one. We sent a request and allowed our connected app access to our account and tenancy, and we got back the authorization code. Now we just need to extract it. So let's move on to step two. Users are redirected back to you with a code. So this is the code right here. We're given a code that expires after 12 minutes as a security measure, and again, don't worry about state. So let's go back to our browser and extract the code from the redirect URL. We'll manually copy this URL and put it into an input function in Python. We'll then do some string manipulation to extract the code. All I'm doing here is finding the character position of these two words, code equals and scope, which is the start and end position of our authorization code. So I've pasted the URL into the input function and it's extracted my authorization code for me. Great, step two is done. And coming back to the diagram, we've extracted our authorization code. Moving on to step three, exchange the code. So we're now going to exchange our authorization or verification code for an access token. Since we specified offline access in our scope, we're also going to get back a refresh token. So we'll make a post request to this URL and pass in these four parameters. Our header will have an authorization with our client ID and client secret encoded in bytes or base 64. Then in the body, we'll have grant type equals authorization code, code being the authorization code we got back in step two and the redirect URI again from our connected app, which was zero.com. And this is what it looks like in Python code. We have our URL endpoint here, which I've put into this variable called exchange code URL. Our header, which contains authorization code, I've converted this to bytes inside a variable called b64 id secret. This is just encoding the client ID and client secret from the connected app as bytes and decoding it back to UTF-8. Then in the body, I've put grant type equals authorization code, code equals the auth code from step two and the redirect URI. We get a response back as a JSON and convert it to a Python dictionary. And finally, using the return statement, we can extract the access token and refresh token. If we look at the output here, this is a print from our JSON response, which has our access token, the amount of time the token is valid for, the token type, and our refresh token, which we need in order for us to access our counting data for more than 720 seconds or 12 minutes. And this is consistent with the documentation. We didn't get an ID token because we didn't specify it in our scope. This isn't important for us anyway. And this other output is the function returning our access token and refresh token. Step three and four are done. Referring back to our diagram, we've exchanged our authorization code for an access token. Time for step five, check the full set of tenants. This one is pretty straightforward. We make a get request this time, not a post request, and we just pass in our access token and content type as JSON. You'll need to write a for loop to access the tenant ID because it's stored as an item in a list instead of a dictionary. The for loop just helps us access the individual items. Moving on to step six, calling the API. Yes, this is technically step six, but only if you're using an access token without the refresh token, which again is only valid for 720 seconds or 12 minutes. That means 
After 12 minutes of getting the initial access token, you won't be able to use that token to access Zero again. You'll need to go through this whole process, which isn't exactly the most automated way of doing things. This is why we need the refresh token, which creates a new access token for us every time it expires. Just to be clear, it doesn't actually refresh your existing access token. The refresh token creates a new access token for us. This will make sense soon. Let's skip step six for now and go to refreshing access tokens. As I mentioned, access tokens expire after 12 minutes, but you can use a refresh token to get around that. So we need to call this URL endpoint and pass in these four parameters again. Authorization with our client ID and secret as bytes. The content type, which you can see in the example below. Grant type equals refresh token and refresh token equals the refresh token from step four. This is what the request looks like in Jupyter. And then we convert the JSON response to a Python dictionary. And these lines down here will save the new refresh token to a text file, which I'll come back to in a minute why this is required. Then finally, we use the return statement to return the new access token and refresh token. Okay, finally onto step six, call the API. Before I jump into making the get request, I want to explain these three lines here, which relate to the refresh token above. Because our access token expires every 12 minutes, we either have to run through steps one to four every time we call zero APIs, or we can use the refresh token to create a new access token for us, which means we have this unlimited loop of access to zero. So regardless if it's been 12 minutes or not, Every time we access zero, we just create a new access token with our refresh token. That's what's happening here. From the refresh token we saved to a text file up here, we then read the text file with our token in it every time we call the API. We'll assign that to a variable called old refresh token and use that old refresh token to call the zero refresh token function to create a new set of tokens for us. We're able to do this because the refresh token never expires. Once we have our new set of tokens, we can then use that to call the tenant ID, which we need for our get request here, and as noted in the diagram. I hope this makes sense, and if it doesn't, please keep re-watching until you get it because it's super, super important. Okay, moving on to the get request, which I think you get the drill by now. We'll create a get request to this invoices endpoint, or you can choose another endpoint from the list of scopes here. Then we'll pass in these three parameters into the headers. Then we'll convert the JSON response to a Python dictionary and save the results to a text file. Then finally, you can write a little function to extract the fields you want from JSON into a CSV. There's probably a library out there and a more efficient way to convert JSON to CSV, so have a look around for that. And then you can load the CSV into a pandas data frame and do some charting and graphing in matplotlib. Congratulations, you've completed the diagram and integrated Python with zero APIs. Lastly, if this is the first time you're registering your connected app, you'll need to run these two lines to do the first time authentication, which will return a list of our access token at index zero and refresh token at index one. Then you'll call the refresh token function and pass in your old refresh token to create a new access token and refresh token. With that initial setup done, you can then just call the zero request function to query your accounting data moving forward. You won't have to use these two lines above anymore. If you made it this far in the video, thank you for sticking it out. If you decide to write this from scratch and it doesn't work the first time, keep at it. You might try and follow this video while you're coding and find you end up with a different result from me. And that could be because your access token has expired or passed the 12 minute mark, or you've made a post request instead of a get request. Just keep at it because it might take a few tries before it works. In any case, I'll leave a link to my source code in the video description. I hope this video has helped you out. And if you have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment below and don't forget to like and subscribe. Hope to catch you in the next one. See ya.